Namaste. Welcome to this uh, session, the 94th session of uh, Initiative. And Initiative is a national initiative to strengthen collaboration between HIV TV through e learning. And our partners are Echo India, Share India, NITRD, and NACO. And uh, today I welcome all the ART centers from our states of Tamil Nadu, Andhra Pradesh, Delhi, UP, West Bengal, and Northeast. Today we will be uh, discussing a very interesting case. It is a rare presentation of soft tissue tuberculosis, which was in the dorsum of the hand. And this very interesting case has been brought to us by Dr. Rudra, the medical officer of Salem ART Center in Tamil Nadu. Salem, we all know, is one of the very exemplary ART centers of uh, NACO. And we are very happy that they are sharing this case with us. I would just like to request uh, Rudra to kindly to kindly begin her case presentation. So Rudra, can I request you to kindly make the case discussion? Sure, yeah, ma'am. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Rudra from Salem ART Center. And um, the case is a 49 year old male weighing 52 kg. The reason for uh, case presentation is this is a rare presentation of soft tissue tuberculosis in dorsum of the left hand. Date of ART registration is on May 13, 2022. Date of ART initiation is on March 31st in a private hospital. Date of TB con confirmation is on uh, May 3rd. And the ATD initiation was on uh, May 3rd in a private hospital. Type of tuberculosis detected was uh, pulmonary tuberculosis with extra pulmonary. That is granulomatous inflammation on left hand. There is no past history of tuberculosis present. Coming to medical history, patient had a painless swelling in the left dorsum of the hand for the last 25 days. On March 31st, 2022, patient got admitted in a private hospital for complaint of painful swelling in the left hand and movement restriction. History of weight loss, about 5, five kgs in 3 months, loss of appetite was present. History of insect bite allergy was present. Patient was tested HIV reactive and started on uh, TLD. IND under LA was done. On uh, April 24th, the patient was admitted for recurrence of swelling in the left hand. And biopsy was done. On May 3rd, 2022, the report came as granulomatous inflammation of the left hand and the patient was started on AKD4 and then referred to Salem ERT Press Center for registration. Uh, patient reached uh, here by May uh, 13, 2022. He was registered and diagnosed to have a sputum positive pulmonary TB also and uh, he was continued with ART and ATT. FDC. So, uh, thank you, Dr. Rudra. Uh, this is a very interesting case, and we have Professor VK Gautam with us now. So, welcome, Dr. Gautam. We are really, indeed, we are very, very lucky to have such a senior person on our uh, panel today to discuss about this rare presentation of TB in a case of HIV. And uh, I would just like to summarize the case before we move ahead. So, Dr. Rudra, correct me if I'm anywhere wrong in my summarization. As I understand, there was a 49-year-old male. He was, he was diagnosed as HIV positive and started on ART in the private sector on 31st March of this year. Then he was also diagnosed as TB on 3rd May 2022, probably in the private sector. Because after that, she, he was referred to the ART center 10 days later on 13th May 2022. So the patient is diagnosed with, uh, with HIV on 31st March. He takes ART. After taking ART for nearly two months, he develops TB. There's a swelling in the dorsum of the hand, which was initially IND. It was, they took out the pus from it, they IND the swelling, and the IND was done somewhere in uh, March itself, I think. But unfortunately, that time, the pus was not sent for CBNAT. It was not sent for smear of AFB. It was not sent for any culture. So the swelling was just IND I and it was left as such. Then the swelling recurred. Even though there was a history of fever and loss of appetite and loss of weight for three months, somehow, wherever he was started his HIV treatment, they did not think of TB. So they started HIV TB. Then there, there is development of, uh, then there is a development of swelling on the dorsum of the hand. 
it is incised and drained it is not sent for any test it is just sealed i think or probably dressed again again it reappears this time they send the uh, sample for a histopath and this time the histopath shows that it has tuberculosis uh, findings are suggestive of tuberculosis and the patient is started on att and referred to the salem art center where after complete investigation the patient is also find, found to have pulmonary tb though his x ray is normal his cbnat of the sputum is positive and the cbnat shows that it is a rif sensitive tb so this is a case where despite having porous symptoms the patient was not uh, properly worked up for a uh, tuberculosis uh, outside the art centers and and is basically a reflection of unawareness among the private sector it is not a reflection of intent bad intent or missing intent or not wanting to do the right things it is just a reflection of the lack of awareness and all of us sitting in art centers it is our job to make the private sector more and more aware of what is porous screening in people living with hiv and why somebody who is porous positive why they need to be uh investigated thoroughly for tuberculosis before they are started on art so with this brief case summary his uh, cd4 counted presentation was 310 but then we have to remember he was already on art for two and a half months before he reached the salem art center and even with a diagnosis of active tb he was somewhere around 310 his crack name his lft his L his uh, kft his hb all were normal and uh, as i already said there was a cbnat of the uh, sputum which showed a rif sensitive pulmonary tb also so this is a case of pulmonary plus extra pulmonary tb the patient was started on fdc four pills per day according to weight and was given dtg plus dtg Uh, TLD plus DTG as the ART regimen and patient is also on septal prophylaxis. So the reason for presentation of this case in this forum is it is a soft tissue TB of dorsum of left hand, a rare case of TB. So even though there are several uh, aspects to, to this particular uh, to this particular session, like there was a delay in IPT. Now the IPT guideline says that we have to start IPT right at the time of ATT in people who are porous negative. so either they totally missed out that the patient was porous positive so if they missed out that the patient was porous positive then they should have given him ipt but that's a good thing that they forgot about the ipt also because actually this was a case of active tb and in a case of missed active tb there can be nothing more criminal than starting a single drug as ipt so in a way it is good that they didn't really bother about the porous positivity or the ipt like what we do in our government art centers under the government guidelines and they started the patient on art a diagnosis was missed with immune reconstitution due to art the tb flared which was till then maybe silent maybe not silent it flared so a missed diagnosis treatment getting uh, the tb gets flared and then it is picked up two and a half months after the patient is started on art he comes to salem art center where they also find an additional site site of tb tb and the correct treatment is started so though there are lots of issues in this uh, case today what we would focus on would be the rarity of tb in the dorsum of the hand for that we have a very very senior orthopedic surgeon from uh, from uh, our community we have dr vk gautam he was the head of mulana azad medical college the major college in new delhi and now he has retired and he is the head of uh, orthopedics in a uh, sharda medical college which is also a very very reputed medical college of delhi dr gautam we welcome you sir and we would request you to give your didactic and to give your insights into the management of this case okay uh, am i audible yes sir so fine uh, good afternoon and uh, i welcome you all for this very interesting session so as as we were discussing musculoskeletal tuberculosis is a local manifestation of a generalized disease you may not be able to find a chest lesion but often if you do a very detailed investigation chest or gastrointestinal or some other area of focus may be there so out of the musculoskeletal tuberculosis uh, all of you must be aware that tb of the spine the so called pot spine is the commonest variety of tuberculosis followed by tuberculosis of other major joints like the hip joint knee joint and uh, some of the other small joints 
but uh, tuberculosis of the soft tissue is a very, very common, uncommon entity. So now this uh, 49 years old gentleman presented with painless swelling over the dorsum of the hand for the last 25 days. And uh, normally, a average uh, physician or even an orthopedic surgeon may not be aware that this type of diagnosis of tuberculosis can be there in the tendon sheets and the bursi also. And this was a case which was uh, having all the typical scenario to develop tuberculosis. He was a case of HIV, he was on ART, and uh, an astute clinician should always think that there is a possibility of tuberculosis. So, because he had a history of waste loss, and uh, somebody did an IND considering that it is a pyogenic abscess. Now, I would like to highlight, you all must be aware, but I like to once again uh, highlight that uh, there is a condition called cold, cold abscess. It looks like an abscess, but the local temperature is not raised and uh, it is not acute. It is a slowly growing swelling. And when you aspirate this swelling, it contains uh, serum, granulation tissue and uh, necrotic caseous material. Okay, so as I was discussing that uh, IND normally in a suspected tubercular abscess or a cold abscess should not be done because it leads to a chronically discharging sinus. If at all you have to drain, you have to do an anti-gravity drainage, which means that pus should not uh, keep on percolating. For example, if you are doing a cold abscess in the back, you should make an incision on the top so that with gravity, the pus should not come down. Now, in in this case, there was a recurrence of swelling and maybe IND, they might have sent for culture and sensitivity, even if you send it for an AFB smear, as tuberculosis uh, in the musculoskeletal system is a possible ancillary disease, AFB are not seen. So you are uh, expected to send it for a CBNAT at least because AFB count is very low. So now, in a, a swelling of, of the hand, you should, the common swellings around the dorsum of the hand are a ganglion, which is a very common swelling, which is arising from the tendon sheets. Other swellings could be a xanthoma, and a few other swellings uh, could be there. The, some of the inclusion cysts and the dermoid cysts could also be there. So one should clinically examine the case and try to find out whether the swelling is arising from the skin, subcutaneous tissues, tendon sheath, or tendon of the underlying structures. So the second thing, important thing, is that any case case of suspected infection or process, epitrochlear lymph node, which is approximately 5 to 7 centimeter above the medial condyle, epicondyle, should be palpated. And if that is uh, matted or it's enlarged, then you can even go ahead with the uh, FNAC of that area and confirm the swelling. So now these are the differential diagnosis which can be there in a swelling which is arising from dorsum of the hand. Ganglion is a painless swelling and uh, it doesn't hurt and it stays uh, like that. We need not treat it. Now, compound palmar ganglion is a very special type of situation which is generally seen in tuberculosis of the tendon sheets. Why it is called compound? Because if in my hand, uh, the swelling is arising from the flexor side of the dorsal side, as it crosses the wrist, when it goes into the forearm, there is an extensor retinaculum. So that retinaculum will press this, uh, make this swelling bilobed. One part will be there in the dorsum of the hand, the other will be in the arm or forearm. So it's, it's typically called a compound palmar ganglion. If you push the swelling from dorsum of the hand, the swelling will go into the forearm. And if you push from the forearm, it will likely to go back into the dorsum of the hand. Foreign body granuloma, AB malformation, this is just to mention that these are other possibilities which can be there in a swelling of the hand. Spina vendosa is a condition which is, uh, the tuber which is also called tuberculosis dactylitis. Dactylitis means phalanges or metacarpal tuberculosis presents like spina ventosa. And uh, if the abscess ruptures, this can also go into the tendon sheaths from the bone and lead to soft tissue tuberculosis. Pigmented villonodular cyanotomitis is another condition to be just aware of, but this is generally a very huge and painless swelling. So these are the differential diagnosis in a swelling over the dorsal of the hand. In a clinical setting where you are expecting tuberculosis, typically you are expected to see a compound palmar ganglion. Now, you are expected to do some investigations like X-ray of the affected hand. If there is an underlying tuberculosis of the bone, which is spina ventosa, it will, I'll show some X-ray pictures later on. It will show as a sclerotic lesion in the metacarpolar phalanges and the whole uh, phalanx of the will be ballooned out. 
Of course, chest X-ray, as in this case, later on uh, proved that it was a case of tuberculosis. So in every suspected case, you should get a chest X-ray. And uh, also CBC, CRP, and ESR, inflammatory markers may be increased, indicative of an active infection. So this is the clinical picture of the compound palmar ganglion over the dorsum of the hand There is a swelling. And this swelling is crossing across the extensor retinal of the wrist and going into the forearm also. So infection in these cases reaches the synovial sheath or bursi by hematogenous spread from the underlying bone in joint disease like underlying spina ventosa. Accidental direct inoculation can also be seen uh, in the people like microbiologists who are uh, working in the laboratories and they can get infected by needle pricks and lead to this infection. And these are pictures of the hand which again show one of the features of a swelling, which can be tubercular infection of the tendon sheaths of the hand, one in the thinner evidence. And when you operate upon this swelling, if you see this has been incised and operated, you find there's a swelling proximal to the uh, flexor retinaculum and another one distal to the uh, flexor retinaculum. And in, in between around the wrist, there's a constriction because the band is not allowing the uniform spread of infection. So now, briefly, we'll mention what is tuberculosis tenosynovitis. It's a rare infection in seen in tuberculosis and develops slowly and insidiously, progressive swelling with limited excursion of tendons. Apart from the swelling, the patient will not be very uh, effectively using his hand because the tendons are stuck inside the hand and there may be difficulty in making a grip and the stiffness can be there. Now, rheumatoid arthritis of the hand can also sometimes present like this. So you have to be very careful to make a diagnosis. Rheumatoid also can present like this stiffness and restriction of finger movements along with the swelling. And commonest side which seen is on the flexor side, but this particular case, the extensor tendons are involved. And uh, synovial membrane, you see all the tendons, they are passing through the tendon sheaths. There, that tendon sheath is like a tunnel through which the tendons glide. And uh, the tendon sheaths are lined by the synovial and the the parietal and the visceral layer of the synovial membrane, just like the synovial membrane of a joint. So a hematogenous spread can lead to granuloma formation within the tendon sheath. And on palpation, the swelling is doughy in consistency. And a soft tissue crepitus can be felt. Soft tissue crepitus, you just touch the area, there's maybe some crepitations underneath that swelling. And ultimately, in a long-standing case, the tendons may rupture and the patient may lose the function of the hand. Now, this is... Uh, during surgery, one of the compound palmar ganglion, we are removing the tendon sheath from the tendons. Underlying, uh, you can see these tendons which are being separated out from the tendon sheath, which is infected. And then there are multiple loose bodies like this, which are called villain seat uh, loose bodies. Now they happen because there's a villous pro proliferation of the synovial membrane within the tendon sheath. And because of the movement, repeated movement of the hand, the villi, villi of the tendon sheath, they separate and uh, multiple loose bodies, sometimes hundreds of them will come out when you incise the tendon sheath. Next one. So under the microscope, oh, you can see this villi and uh, these are multiple loose bodies. Which if they are smaller, they are called rice bodies. And if they are slightly bigger, they are uh, called the watermelon bodies. They are not seen in the x-rays. Because they are not only their fibrinous material, which is separated from the tuberculous caseous material and the villi, which are there in the tunnel tendon sheets. And this is an arthroscopic picture of the wrist and showing these uh, loose bodies inside. Next one. So now various presentations of tuberculosis present synovitis. The infective uh, synovium gets edematous and with granulation tissues becomes hypertrophic. Excessive synovial fluid may be produced, giving almost painless swelling. And sometimes, frank must, pus may not be seen. As in this case, when somebody aspirated, there may not be any pus. I do not know because we do not have the information. Somebody did an ID, IND and I don't know what type of material he got, but uh, he could not confirm the diagnosis with this. Next one. Now, this is an MRI picture. In MRI picture, you can easily pick up the black tendon sheets and uh, in a contrast MRI, you can outline the abscess shadows also because uh, wherever there's a vascularity, the cold abscess, the boundaries of the cold abscess will be lined by the contrast 
but this, wherever there's a pus in the center that will not be highlighted. So this is called a ring enhancement, which is seen in tubercular infections. Next. So this is another MRI picture showing MRI, uh, showing a tubercular tenosynovitis. Next. So spina ventosa uh, is different from the tubercular tenosynovitis. If you see the X-ray on the right side, the third metacarpal in the middle is ballooned out and there's a sclerotic X-ray picture. So let me clarify that normally in tubercular infections of the spine and in the joints, the bones are never sclerotic. Bones are generally osteoporotic. They lose calcium and mineral, but uh, rare presentation is seen in the hand and the foot bones. If in the hand and the foot bone, the tubercular osteomyelitis can look sclerotic rather than osteoporotic. The reason being that the tubercular osteomyelitis is in the generally younger individuals in the head, and there is an ep profuse blood supply, and the whole metacarpal gets dented with a granuloma, and there is a periosteal reaction. So, exceptional sclerosis, which is seen in tuberculous dactylitis of the head, which is generally not seen in tuberculous infection of the other skeleton. Next one. So this was the publication of spina ventosa. Now it is a very well recognized uh, and one should be aware of this diagnosis and treat this. If this tuberculosis ventosa ruptures, then this can lead to tuberculosis uh, uh, tenosynovitis later on. Next one. Uh, this is the reason I told you why there's an expansion. Normally tuberculosis infection, osteomyelitis doesn't lead to enlarging of the bones or distension of the bones. So hand and the foot bones uh, are exceptional where the bones can enlarge and form this type of picture. And diaphysis also is involved. Normally the tuberculosis occurs around the epiphysis and the metaphysis. Long bone also epiphysis and metaphysis, but diaphysis can be involved in the small bones of the hand. And sometimes I hope you are aware of the sequestra. Sequestra are small dead bone which are separated from the surrounding bone by infected granulation tissue. And in sequestra, the tuberculosis sequestra generally coke and sand type of sequestra. This is a picture which is described in the X-rays of tuberculosis dactylitis. And ultimately, the whole metacarpal may collapse, leading to the shortening of the finger and loss of function. If treatment is started early and function and the hand is protected with the help of a splint, the tendons will not rupture, and ultimately you can regain a good function of the hand. So this is a treated uh, early trial. Tuberculosis, which was treated and ultimately everything became alright. So this is tubercular arthritis. Now, as we were just simply talking of all the hand infections of the tuberculosis, so as the hip and knee can be involved, the tubercular wrist also can be involved in involving the carpal bones like uh, the lunate, scaphoid, and all eight carpal bones can be infected. And uh, the capitate is the most common uh, infection in the hand and you will find a swelling all around the wrist and there will be a restriction of dorsiflexion and palmar flexion of the wrist. All right, next one. So treatment, apart from after confirming the diagnosis with CBNET and uh, the treatment is anti-tubercular treatment for the duration, normally in extra pulmonary tuberculosis we like to give <laughs> anti-tubercular treatment for a longer time. Rest in the functional position. You see, if you do not put a splint in these cases, the hand can get <laughs> deformed and the function of the hand, hand, uh, hand may be lost. And at the same time, as the pain subsides, intermittent excursion and strengthening exercises of the tendons should be, you can give a ball, a silicone ball into the hand of the patient so that the grip strength, strength is maintained and deformity do not develop. In case the patients do not respond to treatment, and if the organism is sensitive to refemsin ILH, in non-responders, sometimes we can do an open debridement and remove all the dead and the necrotic material and to the reduce the local load and the rest of the treatment will continue with the splintage and early physiotherapy and mobilization. Next. So summary, all these swellings, will tubercular swellings will present very insidiously, slowly over a period of time. The pain is generally not a very prominent feature. Stiffness of the hand can be there because once the tendons are involved, the hand function is lost and there may be some stiffness. 
local warmth mild local warmth is there it is not like a pyogenic abscess that is why this little warmth is called a cold abscess though there is an abscess but they are called cold abscesses and boggy on palpation mild tenderness and boggy means doughy type of feel not a frag fluid but doughy type of feel and uh, pseudo fluctuation means in a fluctuation normally there is a cross fluctuation in the longitudinal as the transverse plane but here since it is involving the tendon sheath the fluctuation only occurs in one direction as I told you in a compound palmar ganglion, if you push the swelling from the palmar aspect of the hand, it goes into the forearm. And when you press from the forearm, it goes back to the hand. And a soft tissue crepitus, a very silky kind of crepitus, as if you are if you are rubbing a fine, a, a rough cloth, you find some crepitus, that kind of feeling can be there when you put your finger over the swelling. And if you normally sinus formation does not take place, but if you do an IND and open this swelling, then sinus formation can be there. There can be secondary infection and this can continue for a long time. And uh, never uh, forget to palpate the local lymph nodes. For example, in this hand, the epitrochlear lymph node is the first node to be affected. And you should always look in a hand swelling epitrochlear lymph node, which is 5 centimeter above the medial epicondyle of the elbow on the medial side. I think is that all or one more slide? Next one. I think with that, I thank all the organizers to give me this opportunity. Sir, thank you very much. That was uh, such an informative talk that uh, okay. it, is, uh, so it was too informative. And uh, working in HIV and TB, we see all kinds of complex presentations. And uh, this is one of the rarest cases that we have discussed over the past two years. So I would just summarize by saying that Dr. Gautam told us that uh, in musculoskeletal TB, spinal TB is the commonest, followed by TB of the joints. And the rarest is the TB of the soft tissue, which we have in this particular case. In this particular case, as it was said, I would actually begin with the last take home message. I am beginning the summarization with that. As sir said, a uh, insidious swelling, which is painless or there's only mild pain, with stiffness, some look, uh, some restriction of movement, mild tenderness, and boggy on palpation, with probably a sinus from it, would be the kind of swelling where you would say that okay, it is the rarest of the rare case of musculoskeletal TB in which the uh, soft tissue is being affected. Another very important point that Sir said was that if you ever see such a swelling, the first thing that you should do is palpate the lymph node. For a swelling on the dorsal or the flexor side of the hand, the first thing that should have been done was palpation of the epitrochlear lymph node, which is the lymph node which is five centimeters above the medial malleolus, that is in the elbow. And if that is swollen, you can very well FNA that lymph node and reach your diagnosis. So FNAC of a lymph node would any day be easier and would give you a definite microbiological and histopathological diagnosis than it would be for a general practitioner or a medical officer of the ART to FNA or to manage the swelling of the hand. So please remember to palpate the lymph node if you see a swelling of the hand. The other thing that Sir said told us was that there are two ways in which we can have a TB of the hand of the soft tissue and even the bone one could be a compound palmar ganglion. In a compound palmar ganglion, either the flexor side or the extensor side, there is swelling in the synovial membrane and the soft tissue. And it is because it is interacted by the extensor reticulum on the extensor side, dorsal side, and the flexor reticulum on the palmar side that you can have a bilobed swelling. Now this bilobe swelling can be pushed from the wrist into the palm and from the palm into the wrist. So though it appears to be fluctuant, it is a pseudo fluctuation. It is not fl fluctuating in the, it is not fluctuating in the horizontal, it is not fluctuating horizontally. It is only going in and out of the uh, reticulum of the flexor or the extensor part. Another way which he said that we, you could have TB of the hand could be spina ventosa. In spina ventosa, actually it is the bone itself which gets swollen up. And what you see as a swelling is actually a bone which has become sclerotic and it has become swollen up because of, uh, it has ballooned out because of tuberculosis of the bone and on X-ray you see a sclerotic picture. 
So in this case, though we do not have an X-ray of the hand, it most probably was not a, a spina ventosa. It was not a dactylitis, which is only limited to hand and feet where TB is concerned, but it was actually a compound power ganglion. Now in the power ganglion, the main thing that Sir said was that if you do an IND, it has to be done anti-gravity. You should avoid doing an IND in a tubercular structure because it can lead to chronic discharging sinus. But if you have to do it, then you should do it anti-gravity. And in this case, the IND was done without any awareness about it being TB or not. We should investigate the patient for TB other sides. We should do an extra chest. We should do hemoglobin, CRP, ESR, plus obviously a radiology and a simple X-ray of the affected hand to see whether the underlying bone is affected or not. So then as I said, it could be a hematinogous spread or it could be a direct spread like it is seen in microbiologists and sur surgeons when there is a direct inoculation or there could be an underlying spina ventosa which can also cause this tenosynovitis. As Sir already told us that it is very rare, the swelling is doughy and there can be a crepitus in it. And if not controlled at the normal time, the tendons can ultimately rupture, which can lead to restrict, which can lead to the person losing the function of his hand. Initially, in some cases, the swelling, the restricted movement, and the stiffness can mimic rheumatoid arthritis. So if you find somebody like this who is not tuberculosis in your practice of people with HIV, always keep the consideration of rheumatoid arthritis in your mind if the patient, if TB is ruled out. In HIV, we would always say, please rule out TB first and then think of others, especially with somebody with a CD4 of 300 already on ART for three months. Also, sir, showed us some very interesting per operative pictures in which he showed that there can be certain loose bodies which are actually break breakaway parts from the fibrous material that has broken away from caseous necrosis that is seen in TB. These are not seen on x-rays because this is just fibrous material. And if they are big, they look like melon seeds. And if they are small, they look like rice seeds. And there can be hundreds of them inside one joint, depending upon how much uh, joint destruction and the chronicity of the disease. Uh, Sir then showed us some very interesting MRIs. He showed us an X-ray where he showed that wherever there is a tubercular lesion, the tubercular lesion is surrounded by a normal lesion, which a normal area which looks like a ring enhancing lesion because the uh, the lesion that we see does not show up on the MRI and everything around it shows up. So it is called a ring enhancing lesion. This ring enhancement, I'll just like to clarify. Yes, this sir. ring enhancement is seen in a contrast MRI. Okay, sir. You see in the abscess, the contrast will not go because there's no blood in the abscess. Okay. But the wall of the abscess is vascular and that will be enhanced. So that will cause a typical ring enhancement with the black inside and a contrast enhanced periphery. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you Go so ahead. much. Sir. There was a lacuna in my understanding. Thank you so much. So it is in a contrast enhanced MRI that you will see this ring enhancing lesion. And it is because the abscess doesn't have blood vessels. So it will not show up on contrast. But the abscess wall has blood vessels which will get colored by the contrast. That is why it is called a ring enhancing lesion. And for treatment, sir said that, OK, you will give ATT, you will give ART. But we should remember that we also need to do other things to keep the uh, to maintain the function of the body part. That should be splintage. It should be intermittent uh, excursions and strengthening exercises. Like Sir said, you can give us a uh, silicone ball for the patient to intermittently squeeze so that they can uh, they can keep some strength in their tendons and muscles. And thirdly, if they are not responding to simple debridement and to treatment and to chemotherapy and to the other, other two options, you might need to do tendon repairs in such cases. And debridement. And debridement and uh, tendon repair in such cases. You might actually have to open the joint and do debridement or even tendon repair if they are not responding to medication and above two measures of splintage and strength mus uh, and muscle strengthening. So this was. Such an excellent case and such an excellent talk, sir. We can't thank you enough. But now I want to ask Dr. Rudra, is your question answered? Do you now know what more you have to do for your patient because he's still in your follow-up? Yes, ma'am. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, 
at present uh, he has completed his ATT and his uh, swelling has reduced significantly and but there is a slight uh, movement restriction is present in the patient apart from that he is fine now so sir please can i ask you a question can we send him to a physiotherapist at this time sure sure how long how long the patient has uh, taken ATT by now 6 months sir ha huh, so 6 months he has taken certainly she should attend <laughs> a uh, physiotherapy department to do strengthening exercises and to correct any deformities to see the treatment difference between pulmonary tuberculosis and all varieties of musculoskeletal tuberculosis in be fine we want to function musculoskeletal system has some function that has to be attained so uh, i wish if you could have brought a final picture of the hand of the patient whether there is any deformity or not that i do not know so this can be definitely corrected in fact physiotherapy should have been started approximately after 3 to 4 weeks of itt because by that time the inflammation and the infection significantly subside and you can start early moment within the splint also to prevent deformities and to to provide certain but now that because if you do it late there may be some uh, stiff resistance or stiffness and the fibrosis of the tendon sheaths but still uh, the patient will be benefited by doing physiotherapy thank you sir so oh, thank uh, so dr rudra is that uh, clear yes ma'am and if you think there is a incomplete response or anything you could actually extend the att no ma'am yeah, yeah you can yes you can extend the att six oh, to yeah. so actually for musculoskeletal of course for spinal we say it is at least a year that is there but for other musculoskeletal and like this soft tissue one also if you feel that there has been an inadequate response or there has been a delayed response or you would like to do that the rntcp guideline or the ntp guideline gives you permission to extend it by 3 months the cp by 3 months after yeah, yeah we certainly we certainly like to extend it okay. for at least 3 more months after you finish the initial 6 months So can I please uh, can I please uh, request you to possibly show the case to an orthopedic surgeon now because all extensions under the national program are done under the care of a specialist. So a specialist for the TB of the dorsum of the hand would be an orthopedic surgeon. So I would request you to send your patient to an orthopedic a surgeon, get an extension of ATT from him, written from him, and also uh, show him for physiotherapy and other further procedures that would be needed. because a hand is obviously an important appendage of the body uh dr rudra while you are doing the feedback and i thank you very much for showing this very important case to me i have not seen a case of soft tissue tb ever and it was so interesting and i request you as dr gautam has said please upload a video with this hand movements and the recovery that is there in the swelling and that there is a provision of actually even uploading that video on the i echo platform and it can be accessed by all our art centers and to our expert we will send it separately but for the remaining art centers it can be seen on the i echo itself if you send us the video we will do it so anybody who is logged in they can download the presentation and keep it in your sir it's uh, and keep it in your records because these cases will be far and few in between so whenever we see these cases we have to learn from them and put them in our mental diary that okay something like this can happen you might see a next case like this 5 years away so please remember these cases and these rare cases is the reason that uh, initiative is there with the very common ones the rare ones are also equally important because as you know all life is important and all cases need to be managed so this is the presentation Uh, has everybody done the feedback can i thank dr gautam yeah thank you so much madam thank and you, thank sir. you thank so you much for sir. your excellent summarization i think it was better than what i did Are your sir. summary of the whole thing was better than what i presented yes, sir as sir you presented it beautifully i summarized from the point of view of the medical officer who is sitting in the art center right, right. so you are an expert in our gps that's why i summarized it that way sir so thank you so much sir off now? Okay. yes sir Bye. so thank you so thank much so much sir sir we are grateful Great Thank you for your guidance. Thank you.